Oh, well, isn't this good? Are you having a good time? You know, I keep saying to myself, how can you not love this stuff? This is, uh, oh my goodness, so much fun. Turn, turn to somebody and say, come on, lighten up a little bit. Put a smile on your face and, and uh, for goodness sake, you know, let the joy of the Lord be your strength here. Oh, yeah. And, uh, oh my goodness, there's, there's so many people that we really want to thank and appreciate. And I'm just thinking about how blessed we are, Carol, that we have sons and daughters in the Lord like Duncan and Kate that we happily passed the baton over to and uh, Steve and Sandra who have just been so faithful with us for 30 years. You know, Steve and Sandra were Baptist pastors, and uh, their church paid his salary to come and work with us for, for like five months, I think it was, Steve, five months, and uh, it, it got so controversial in that church that the church didn't make it, really, but uh, anyway, Steve and Sandra have just been right with us all the way through the whole the whole thing and Gordon and Kathy here and and just so many and so when when you think about what are the ingredients for having a revival I don't know it's I think the biggest one is faithful godly serving people and the Lord just has surrounded us with with people like that and we got a room full of them here and I just can't wait to hug all of you, but uh, it's, it's just overwhelming. But there's so many moving parts to this whole thing. I mean, we're just getting a Bible school up and running, and Rich, thank you so much, but it's the Lord that gave you that dream, really, with Logos Training Center, and make sure you check that out, because You'll be able to study online and everything. And the thing that's exciting about that is it is accredited. And accreditation means an awful lot to parents sending their kids to a school. You know, they want to know, yeah, well, I'm glad you are interested in the Bible and everything. But do you get any accreditation for all that you're doing? And the answer would be, yes, we do. Oh, well, okay. Then that can work towards uh, what they might think a degree that has more usefulness in terms of career moves and stuff. But uh, the revival that we're going into is going to be one of the Word and the Spirit together. And so it isn't just all uh, fire and power. It's, it's a proper container with, this, with the Word of God. And uh, I remember a comment John Wimber made years ago. He was challenged by people in his church that were saying, how far are you going to let this thing go? And he said, no farther than this book. And he said, they were strangely comforted by those words. <laughs> but there's a lot in here that um, maybe doesn't bring the kind of comfort that they were looking for. But what we want to do is press in and press on and keep going because it's just going from glory to glory and uh, getting better and better. I want to talk to us tonight about the kingdom of God and how... You know, you hear about worldview, and you hear about this view and that view, but there, there is a, a way of looking at the kingdom, a paradigm that we can look at that is very helpful in terms of knowing not only where we've been, but also where we're going and where this whole thing is going to end up. And I love what one theologian, Wayne Grudem, for one, talked about how the kingdom is both now, but not yet. And so we could say the kingdom has been passed 
okay, what Jesus did, what Abraham did, uh, that's, that's all there for our benefit. But then what's going on in the here and now is meaningful when you get miracles happening in your life. But then we also need to know where is this thing going? And where it's going is into a full-on revelation of the kingdom of God. Carol talked about it this afternoon. The return of Jesus is going to be the greatest event since creation. And I'm not speaking on that tonight, but it, it, it troubles me that so many charismatic churches are not even talking about the soon return of the Lord. When he was forever talking about it, in fact, that was his paradigm. When I return, when I come again, will I find faith on the earth, etc., etc. And so we are living in a time when we have the kingdom both now, but not yet, in all of its fullness. And he's the one that's ushering in that kingdom because he is the king. And what does all this do for you? Well, let's go together to Matthew chapter 3. And um, we see John the Baptist here. And he's in full stride. Matthew 3, verses 1 and 2. In these days, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So this kingdom is not only past and it's not only future, but it's also very much present. When something is at hand, that means your little step of faith can reach out and take a hold of it. And there's a call to be a little bit childlike with this because you're taking hold of things that you don't always see. In fact, you seldom see. So you take a hold of them by faith. And why don't we just practice? Why don't you just reach out your hand and say, I'm going to take a hold of the promises of God. I'm going to take a hold of the things of the kingdom. Because we believe in a supernatural kingdom. I'm thinking of the words that Jesus said in, in John chapter 1 to Nathaniel. And when he met him, he said, wow, well, here's an Israelite indeed that is no guile within his heart. You know, he, he's pure. He's honest. And, and he says, how do you know me? And do you remember Jesus' answers is, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And the guy's so surprised, he's like, you're the Messiah, you're the King of Israel. And Jesus is kind of like, I vey. <laughs> Just because I said that, you believe? You're going to see greater things than this, my friend. You're going to see the angels of God uh, ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now, that's a profound word. How many would want to step into that? Do you know what qualified him for that? Because he believed. And, you know, I was doing a lot of thinking about this lately, how jaded we become in our culture. And I, I got to, you know, we, we learned so much just going to Brazil two months ago. And, uh, but one of the things was that the children there were so trusting. And we had little children coming up to Carol and I, and, and, and I'd say, yeah, yeah, like, what, what would you like? She said, I would just like a hug. And these little kids would want a hug, and I thought, well, how different it is here now in our culture where, unfortunately, sadly, parents are having to say, now, don't hug strangers and don't let people, 
you know, give you candy or money or don't fall for their little puppy or whatever. And we're taught to be suspicious and distrusting. And it's a big hurdle for us because we've got to recover that now to where we can start to believe. Imagine if you're going to grow up in heaven. You know, I often thought about Jesus was um, incredulous many times that the disciples still didn't fully believe him. And what made that so hard is, of course, all he's ever known is the culture of the kingdom of heaven. And in that culture, just think about this. No one ever lies to you. No one ever tries to manipulate you. No one ever tries to bully you. No one ever tries to steal from you. Uh, everybody is just there for your good. They want to help you. They want to reinforce everything. And imagine being a child growing up in a culture like that. Where you never have to tell them, don't talk to strangers. But you tell them, go, go talk to strangers. Go welcome them. Go give them a drink of water, whatever it is. And so the paradigm shift that we want to make is to, Lord, help us to become childlike and start to trust in you and start to believe and not become jaded because there's one or two or 50 or 100 people out there who have lied to you, misrepresented to you, and promised and broke them, and on and on and on. We are getting groomed and prepared for the culture of the kingdom of heaven. So John the Baptist starts out right here in Matthew 3, and, and uh, he's preaching in the wilderness and saying, verse 2, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And what that means is, hey, you're going your own way, Stop where you are, turn around, and head towards God. That's repentance. Start heading towards God. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is within your reach. You can just reach out and begin to take a hold of it. Well, then John's busy baptizing and everything, and one day Jesus comes to him. And uh, we see that in verse uh, 13 of that same chapter, Jesus came from Galilee to John to the Jordan, and he wants to be baptized. And so here's an amazing thing. The Son of God, now 30 years of age, comes to this wilderness preacher, and he says, I want to be baptized. And John is like, what? No, I, I should be uh, the one that is baptized by you, and you're coming to me? Let's do it this way, John. Let's do it because it, 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 it gives all the right optics. And so, okay. And as Jesus goes under the water that day, something supernatural happened. There was a suddenly, the heavens are torn open, the Spirit descends uh, like a dove, resting on Jesus, the Son of God. John saw it, Jesus saw it, and then a voice from heaven spoke, this is my beloved Son. So there's an invasion of the kingdom and a manifestation of all three of the Trinity, and Jesus is anointed now for his supernatural ministry. He'd never done miracles up to this point, Right away, he goes into the wilderness, and if you read Mark's account, it says he was driven into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. Wow. How many would like the Holy Spirit to drive you into the wilderness for 40 days? And, you know, he came out in the power of the Spirit, victorious. One of the reasons was because he... Every time he was severely tested by the, by the enemy, the devil, he would say, it is written. And that's a good thing to know the word of God, isn't it? But it is written. Don't do that. So I'm not doing that. And 
he came and returned now in the power of the Spirit. And, and let's, let's look over to verse uh, chapter 17 of chapter 4. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Same message. Hey, turn around. Start heading towards God. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is right here. It's within your reach. And he wants you to take a hold of it and let the dynamic of that change everything in your life. Oh, my goodness. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But then it carries on. Let's look at verse 23. Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching, notice, the gospel of the kingdom. He wasn't just preaching repentance. He was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. What is that like? He's declaring that the kingdom is here right now. The rule and reign of God is here right now. And look at the impact. Healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. And his fame went out throughout all Syria. And they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments. And those who were demonized, epileptics, paralytics. And he healed them all. Turn to your friend and say, he healed them all. He's not now just declaring the kingdom of God. He's demonstrating the kingdom of God. And the impact was exponential. Because John had thousands following him, but now the crowds grew to an unbelievable size. It was like half the nation is wanting to get in on this because the promises of God in the word are being fulfilled right here. This, we believe, is the Messiah who has come. And so it just kept heating up from there. He demonstrates the kingdom with signs and wonders, healing every sickness and every disease. Now, let's go to Matthew chapter 9 and verse uh, 35. Another typical day, Jesus is speaking to the crowd outside. And he went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitude, he's moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Now, what do you think is the matter with the people? When you read scripture, you got to put yourself in the story and you got to wonder and you got to ask questions. That's an odd comment, like everybody's all scattered and everything. You'd have thought they'd have been singing and dancing and praising the Lord and celebrating this one's healing and that one's healing. What do you think's going on? Here's what I think the crowd is so big. They're all trying to get to this one man with the anointing and they carried their poor sick mother for five miles and by the time they got there, the sun's starting to go down and there's a thousand other people ahead of them and they're, what are we going to do? And they're all milling around like sheep with no shepherd. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Notice his solution. He said to the disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but... The laborers are few. We don't have enough workers. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now, in the original, there's no break here. It's not stop thinking, move to another chapter, new idea, get ready. No, no. It flows right on, and it says this. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power, New King James, but 
authority in the Greek over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of diseases. So Jesus said, hey guys, come here, gather around. I got something for you. You're all about to get an upgrade. And if you read this parallel account in Luke chapter 9, verse 1, Luke says, he gave them power and authority, dunamis and exousia, two things that are hand in hand here, power and authority. Now, enter into the story and try to imagine what this looked like. Hey, guys, gather around. So they, they all gather around. And Jesus prays for them and imparts to them. What did that look like? What do you think? Peter and John standing there side by side. Peter leans over. Did you feel anything, John? <laughs> no, I didn't. But, you know, he, he's expecting us to act different after this. So I guess we just faith it, don't we? We just take it by faith. And we're... But I don't think that happened. I think they got absolutely blasted. I think they were all down in the dirt right there. Maybe for an hour or two, or maybe for 24 hours. We don't know. doesn't say. But something powerful happened to them. And then they get their marching orders. Look at verse 7. Um, verse 6 says, Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying, What? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. That means if you want the kingdom, you got to just reach out a little bit and take a hold of it. And there's your miracle right there, that kingdom of heaven. And so that's their instructions. Five things to do. As you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Number two, heal the sick. Number three, cleanse the lepers. Number four, raise the dead. And number five, cast out demons. Freely you receive, freely give. So those 12 now are launched out there to do the very works that Jesus did by the same power that is empowering him by the same anointing. And I think it's helpful to, to realize that it was the power of the Holy Spirit flowing through Jesus that enabled him. I don't believe he ever called upon his own divinity to do the miracles. He could have, but he chose not to because how then could be he be an example to you and me. Oh, well, of course he raised the dead because after all, he's God, isn't he? But then, I'm not. That's why it's not working. That's a pretty good cop-out right there. But he's saying, no. When you go, do all this stuff, even raise the dead. And I like to say that's that was on the beginner's list. You would think he would save raise the dead for the advanced class. But, uh, no, no, just get out there, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons, because you have so freely received and so freely give. Now, he's saying this is the kingdom paradigm. There is power and there's life and there's authority flowing in the kingdom of God. Then we see over in Luke's gospel, Luke 10, verse 1, that there's 70 others. 
Imagine the nation is very troubled at one, like Jesus, just uh, changing everything and upsetting the status quo. And they're struggling to try and, ma and, and contain him. And now there's 11 of them out there going. And what's going on here? Jesus never intended to just be the one-man model. Now, of course, he's the king, and he's the son of God, classed by himself. But he's wanting to share his anointing so that this can be family business that is getting around to uh, changing the world here for the good and the glory of God. Family business. Turn to your friend and say, he wants you in on this. He wants you in on this. This is not just for the one or two that's called. How do you know? Because even though now there's 13 of them, it's still not enough. And so in, in Luke 10, 1, we read, after these things the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them out two by two um, before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. So now how many are there? Eighty-three. You know, they thought they had problems with one, and now there's 83 of them. <laughs> Can you see the impact? Israel's not that big a nation. I mean, it's, it, it completely got everything really, really stirred up there, for sure. And those guys went out, and notice verse 9, they get the same instruction, heal the sick, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Now see, that's the message, but we don't often hear that, do we? The message is, hey friends, the kingdom of heaven is right here within your reach. Well, how do we know? Well, you got to reach for it a little bit and then experience the miracle and the transformation that that brings to you. Because then the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and all kinds of good stuff happens. But this gospel that you and I are called to is a supernatural gospel reflecting the kingdom of heaven, and it's not doing it uh, like Wall Street would do it. It's doing it like heaven wants it done. And see, heaven does things different than we do here on earth in the natural. You know, we, um, two years ago, well, it was a year ago, actually, I went, I went to Brazil and uh, Carol mentioned how the, this pastor there, Denarch, he was, he was just, he's the guy that brought a thousand pastors to Toronto over the years. And so as we're driving along in the car, he kept saying things. You see that church there? There used to be 200 people. Now they're 9,000. And then a little further on, you see that church there? They used to have 500. Now they're 12,000 members in that church. And then we're driving along a little more, and you see, you see that church there? They used to be 300, and now they're like 15,000. And it went on and on and on like that. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, Lord, how on earth uh, did things get going like that in Brazil so strong? And I really wanted to know. I was puzzled. Because, see, what we saw was the Holy Spirit was poured out in, in 1994, there was a massive rush. We had like 500 
pastors coming every week and meeting in Toronto. Steve's brother, Richard, we finally turned it over to him to lead that meeting. And these guys wanted to know how can we get in on this and this and that and this and that. And, and it was like, this is amazing. This is no end in sight. I remember going to our capital, Ottawa, and we had about seven or eight churches came together for the meeting, and it was explosive. And it was so good, I said, guys, we want to come back. I went back a year later, and you know that they weren't interested in getting together anymore. And I thought, what? Why not? I mean, we were going full blast at the time. And so it, it's, it's, it's puzzled me. It's worried me. Like, what's going on? And here's Brazil, and Georgia knows another place in, in Bulgaria where the gypsies have been doing a nightly meeting for how long? 25, 25 years. Every night, 25 years. What city is it in? Plovdiv? Kazuma. Do you know where that is, Svetislav? <laughs> you know where it is. 25 years. That's what I call normal. <laughs> when the Holy Spirit is moving, you, you, you know, you hang on to that for dear life. You don't ever let go of it. And so I'm saying, God... What happened with these Brazilians? I'm sure there's exceptions, but most of them that we were running across it just rode that wave and it transformed their lives and their churches. What's the difference? And here's what the Lord said to me. He said, those Brazilian pastors wanted the Holy Spirit on his terms. And a lot of people in Canada and America and in UK and in Europe, oh yeah, we want the Holy Spirit, but on our terms, because there's a couple of things we don't really like. We don't like all that falling. We don't like all that shaking. We don't like all that noise. We don't, we don't understand a lot of that stuff. We don't want that stuff, but we love the transformation. We love that People get saved. We love that they get healed. We love that this and that and the other. Now, see, the way of the kingdom of God is very often upside down to what you and I would think would be the right way to do it sometimes. I'm just saying, right? How many of you want a heaven-sent, unstoppable, Holy Ghost, fiery revival that is going to turn this nation around in Canada and in Europe, and I mean unstoppable. How many want that? Then you can, you, you can mark it down. Take the Holy Spirit on his terms, not yours. And see, he'll, he'll, he'll do things that puzzle you. I, I've said this and shared this so many times, but I was always trying to understand a lot of what God was doing because I didn't know at the time. God, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? Why does everybody fall down? I don't understand. I don't understand. Why do you like it when people fall on top of people? Like all these kinds of questions. I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't understand. Now, I knew it was God, but I just didn't understand why he would do it that way. And one day he said to me, you, some of you have heard me say this, John, you don't even understand women. Why would you think you'd understand me? So there's, there is a logic and a reasoning going on in the heart and mind of God that you don't get really necessarily right away. 
but it makes perfect sense to him, and that's what matters. That really is what matters. I mean, some of the things Dan Slade does, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, Dan, Dan would just surrender. He gave his body to it without un having to understand why. He just said, Lord, do what you want to do with me. And so he would stand on one leg, and he'd paw the ground, and he'd yell a reba, and he'd make faces, and he'd do all kinds of stuff as the Holy Spirit would take him and use him, and, and it would break out in the room. It started last night when he was sharing. A lot of people have wanted to tidy Dan up and said, well, you know, we love Dan and we love what happens when the Holy Spirit falls, but, you know, really all that other stuff, I don't know if that's really, the, you know, the way, the way it needs to go. Forgive me for using you as an example, Dan. But see, it's geared for the children. The kids get it. Now, we just read where Jesus sent 70 others out in Luke chapter 10. And these guys came back and they're all excited. Verse 17, the 70 returned with joy. Say with joy. They weren't discouraged. They didn't say, oh, it was really hard, but, you know, we made it. No, with joy, they came back, big smiles on their face, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus said something like, yeah, I know. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And I give you power. Here's, here's a good verse for your fridge right here. I give you power and authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. <laughs> Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And in that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit. Now this is... I think the only time, or certainly one of the few times in Scripture, where Jesus got hit by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because, see, he's not just happy that they had a good mission. He's rejoicing, but in the Spirit. What's that look like? He's not in the flesh. It's not like his team won the soccer match. No, he's rejoicing in the spirit. There's, there's life on this. There's fire on this. He's, he's bursting out just rejoicing. And look what he says. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. What? Have you ever heard of an evangelist rejoicing that his message has been hidden by a, uh, to a group of people? And they just don't get it? Well, great. I'm glad you're missing it. Hallelujah. <laughs> no. But he says, I thank you, Lord, that you've hidden this from all the wise guys, the guys who think they understand and the guys who think they know what God likes and what God doesn't like and all of that, but you've revealed it to little children. That was your good pleasure. You know, the kids don't mind if there's a, a bit of playfulness going on in the church. Trevor's kids, they just play all over the place in church. It's good, isn't it? Because they learned that church is not the place where you get shut down all the time. It's just, it's fun too. And um, you and I really need to learn to have fun. Like, that was one of the first things Carolyn and I had to learn about the anointing. And when Randy came and 
all the laughter broke out and and all the laughter on the people and on and on it you know at first i was puzzled and perplexed i, I didn't know if i liked it or not and uh but, but we had to learn to be playful because the holy spirit is playful yes. and we had bob jones come to our church one time and you know bob was an interesting guy and uh, I came in the door and made my way into the green room in Toronto. And, and Bob said, hey, hi, Bob. Really good to see you. We're excited that you came and da-da-da-da-da. He looked at me and he says, did you see them? I said, huh? Did you see them? I said, did I see what? You didn't see them? No. Oh, how could you not see them? Come with me. And so he walks me back out into the front door, and, and he said, oh, they're not here. Somebody must have moved them. I'm rolling my eyes at this point, saying, uh, what are we talking about? Can we please just speak English here? <laughs> he said there were... Five smooth stones all sort of arranged right at the door as you came in. And they had a prophetic significance because one was for Goliath and the other for his brothers. And so I'm kind of going, oh, brother, like what are we getting into here? <laughs> and the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me. And he said this. He said, John, I wonder if you would have liked the ministry of Jesus when he was on the earth, if you were alive at that time and walking in, into that. I said, what? He said, oh, yeah, because he was always speaking in parables too. And uh, a lot of people didn't get it. And a lot of people didn't like it. And I thought, ooh. Sorry, Lord. <laughs> I blew it again, didn't I? You know, that kind of thing. And so we have to realize that the message that we carry and bring in part comes disguised uh, so that only the children can really get it it kind of comes in cartoon fashion and, and hidden like parables and, and, and illustrations like that. Now, here was the challenge for me once I clued in that not everything that goes on is the Holy Spirit. So you have to be discerning. And when someone runs around the room full speed, that doesn't necessarily mean that's the Holy Spirit on them. You got to talk to the person. And you got to say, wow, I noticed you were running around the room like five times. What, what's going on? And one guy said to me, my feet were so on fire, I didn't know what else to do. So I just started running. And then, oh, well, that makes sense. Of course, if your feet are on fire, what else are you going to do? But you can't sit back like an expert uh, critic and go, mm, I wouldn't allow that in my church. I wouldn't allow that in my church. Listen, take the Holy Spirit on his terms. And you will have people that don't like it. That's all right. Let them miss it then. You wouldn't believe the number of people that have come to me, you know, 15, 20, 25 years on and said, I am so sorry we missed what was going on in Toronto because we had leaders that we respected and they cautioned us, do not have anything to do with that move that's going on, that craziness that's going on there. And so they missed it. That's the tragedy. You see, 
the children have to have to get it. Where he hides the message sometimes from the wise and prudent. I'll never forget when we were in a place called Stirling, Scotland one time. We're invited there by a pastor, I think his name was Tony Black. And so he arranged a pastor's meeting and we met in this stone Baptist church and all the Scottish worthies were there, the theologians, and they gathered and, you know, the whole place would echo, 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 echo. And we're all there and I'm going to talk to them, okay? But we had this lovely Irish girl named Liz who I had asked if she would just lead uh, in worship for us before, before the talk. Sure. And so Liz would just play her guitar and sing like an angel. But the problem was, every now and then, she would haul off and crow like a rooster. <laughs> I mean, there was no mistake there was no like, oh, that's not, oh, yeah, that is a rooster for sure. <laughs> and so I look around at, at the pastors in the room, and I just see them going, I, I, I knew it, I knew it, it was a waste of time. And different ones would get up, and they would leave, and I'm on the front row going, oh, God, you're killing me. <laughs> <laughs> So finally I take the mic and I walk up and I said, so Liz, thank you for leading us in worship. And, uh, you know, we couldn't help but notice that every now and then you would just crow like a rooster. Have you any idea what that means? She says, I know exactly what it means. I said, you do? Well, what does it mean? She said, it means, wake up, church. <laughs> and then a part of me in my heart went, I knew that, you know. <laughs> but see, something so simple that the kids would get it, but the theologians, it just went right over their head because the God they serve is for the most part no fun at all. And he was just messing with them. Just watch how many of them are going to stumble over this one. Come on, Liz, give them another cock-a-doodle-doo, you know. The, the message of the kingdom is booby-trapped, I'm telling you. <laughs> Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit. And what we see here is a multi-person model where he is not looking for superstars, but he's looking for pastors and leaders that will gather their team around them and, and see to it that that team has a go and they get opportunity to do it. And whatever they're good at, you know, you encourage those things and see, like all the rest of us, you have to do it and do it and do it and do it until you can do it. It's just a matter of doing it and being encouraged the whole time and not Criticized to the point where you got put down. You know, poor Liz, that girl, she, she was subjected to all kinds of people who tried to cast that out of her and all kinds, all kinds of stuff. And, and I understand that, I really do, except that I, for one, was convinced that this was the work of the Holy Spirit, just doing what he loves to do. Wake up, church. Wake up. Well, 
what this brings us to is encounter. Um, Jesus wants you and I to encounter him in power and in love. And it's not that everything has to make sense to you right away, because sometimes you have to wait. I found that the Lord will answer my questions eventually. Some get ans answered right away. Others might take a month or two, and some would take a year or more before you finally get what, it, what, he's, what he's all about. But he wants us to have this childlike faith, putting our faith in the kingdom. And so we want encounter. And I would say to you, please don't ever get tired of receiving yet another touch of God. <sighs> I had a guy say to me one time, so you guys in Toronto, are you still, you know, falling down? And I, I said, oh, yeah, yeah, actually we are. Really? He said, really? He said, well, we did that back in the day, but uh, we've moved on since then. And I said, oh, okay. Um, what have you moved on to? <laughs> and invariably, they moved back to the way they used to do stuff. Because, see, there's only one way that is earth-shaking and world-taking, and that is the out pouring of the Holy Spirit. What happened in the book of Acts in the first two, three hundred years of the church is what is needed yet again. And it's the pouring out of the Spirit, signs, miracles, wonders, joy, peace, love, fun. I mean, we're, we're the happiest people on earth. We're having more fun than should be legal. Carol and I, we've had the ride of our lives. Honestly, 30 years of this? Are you kidding me? We just love every moment of it. <sighs> Plurality of leaders. I need to hurry. Let's go to John chapter 14, verse 12. We've seen Jesus go from 1 to 12, making 13, to 70 others making 83, and man, it multiplied the impact, didn't it? And then we don't know from there, but it went to hundreds and hundreds. You know why? In the book of Acts, in Philippi, they began to call them Christians. If I said, how many Christians in the room, how many would raise their hand? Are you a Christian? You watching on video, are you a Christian? You hold your hand up. What's the word mean? It means little Christ. That's the diminutive in the Greek. Well, what does that mean? It means little anointed one. And they called them little anointed ones because they knew they weren't Jesus, but they were like him because when they prayed, something happened. They were carriers and releasers of the kingdom of God. Turn to somebody near you and say, that's you. You're a carrier of the kingdom. You're one who releases the kingdom. John chapter 14, verse 12. Listen up, little Christian. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, are you a believer in Jesus? Hold your hand up high. Hold your hand up because the angels are counting. See, whose hand's not up right now? Oh, yeah. Here we are, Lord. We believe in Jesus. Okay. He who believes in me, the one who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. Let's stop right there. Forget the greater works. The works that I do, he, she will do. What's the qualification? The one who believes in me. Where are you again? Are you a believer in Jesus? 
the works that I do, you will do. And even greater. What's your greatest favorite miracle that Jesus did in the Bible? Come on. Call it out. Walking on water. Blind eyes. Water to wine. What else? What? Catching all the fish. Yeah, well done, John, from a fisherman. I tell you what, that's a supernatural catch, and it means something. It's like the harvest at the beginning and the harvest at the end. There's coming a harvest of souls to this planet, the like of which we have never even imagined. Shabbat. Hold your hands out to him like this. Say, Lord, I want more. But I also want to use what I already have. I am a Christian. I'm a little anointed one. And I'm brimming over with fire, power, and love. So turn me loose on this pathetic world in Jesus' name. And let's have signs, miracles, and wonders. Now, I got one more point that I want to do. And it has to do with you and I rising up in our authority and bringing the kingdom. You know, authority is something that you have to pick up and use. When he gives you authority, you have to use it like the centurion said, you know. I understand how authority works. I, I have soldiers under me, and I say to this one, hey, go there, and he goes, you, come here, and he comes, and the other, do this, and he does it. I understand how authority works, and I see, Jesus, that you are a man under authority, and so therefore, you've been entrusted with authority. And do you know what Jesus said to him? Wow. I've never seen faith anywhere in all of Israel like this Roman Incredible. Matthew, Matthew 6. We know it as the Lord's Prayer. Lord, teach us to pray. He says, pray like this. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. When you acknowledge God as your father, you're under his authority, that's a subservient position. Lord, you're the boss. I'm under you. I so trust your wisdom, your love, your judgment, your goodness, your kindness. I want to be in that safe place under the shadow of the Almighty. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Then it says, your kingdom come, your will be done. And I taught all our guys this when I learned it. See, in the English, it's obscure. It's not obscure in the Spanish. It's not obscure in the Russian. It's not obscure in many languages. Because this whole prayer is then the imperative tense of the verb. And should be prayed or read like this. Kingdom of God, come. Will of God be done. On earth as it is in heaven. And that's someone who's picked up the authority that's been delegated to them and started to use it. Now one little helpful story. We were praying for lines of people, as we did every night. Uh, Carol would go down one, I'd go down another. The ministry team is praying, and, and, and that's what we did. We'd pray for people. And what did that look like? It looked, it looked like this. I'd be going, on, fire on you. Get him, God. More, Lord. Fill her, Lord. Heal him, Lord. Bless him, Lord. Fill him, Lord. More, Lord. And so at the end of this night, a guy came up to me and he said, may I have a word with you? Sure, I said. He said, 
I am really troubled by the way that you've been praying. I said, really? Why? He said, because you, a mere man, are way out in presumption telling God what he's to do. So I went, huh, thank you very much. So we're in the car going home. And I tell Carol, I said, baby, this guy rebuked me tonight. He's like, accused me of being way out in presumption. I don't want to be out in presumption. I want to get this right, Lord. Lord, help me. Like, what about this? It's a good question, isn't it? What does it look like when you exercise your authority? What does it sound like? Oh, Father, please, if it be thy will, would you come and... So I went before the Lord with it. And the Lord said to me, John, I want you to study the ministry prayers of Jesus. Not his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane when he's talking to the Father about it all. But how did he minister to people? Do you know what he'd say? Pick up your bed and walk. Receive your sight. Hear. Stretch out your hand. And all his ministry is in the imperative tense of the verb. He's giving the orders. He's exercising the authority that has been given unto him by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And so I'm thinking, right. But that's all very well for Jesus because after all, he's the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. He can do that. And the Lord said, I want you to go over and read Philippians chapter 2, which says, though he was God, he did, he did not think his divinity was something that he had to grasp and hold on tight to, but he's willing to release it, step away from it. And so he humbled himself and became and took on him the form of a man. And as if that were not enough, he, he became obedient unto death. And if that was not humble enough, even the death on the cross, which the Bible said, cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. You see, the Jewish people didn't want Jesus just dead. They wanted him crucified. Because if you stone him, you know, that, that, that doesn't make a statement. But if you crucify him, how can he be the Messiah? How can the Messiah be a curse? And they figured that's it. That's the, that's the action we have to take. And he became a curse for us. And the Bible's clear. He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Oh, my gosh. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, Yeshua, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And he's saying, when you pray, say, kingdom of God, come. Will of God be done right here, just like it is in heaven. And you now become an ambassador of Jesus Christ on the earth with full ambassadorial power to bring the kingdom. So, let's stand together, shall we? And uh, we're going to bring the kingdom here in this room. 
And before we do that, I want us to go through a little soul searching. And that is this. If you're upset with somebody for whatever reason, I don't know, they, they were unkind to you, they cheated you, they lied about you, they slandered you, they stole from you, they crashed into your car, they did this, they did Whatever they did, I want you to forgive them. And secondly, I want you to forgive yourself. You say, how do I know if there's anything there? You ask the Holy Spirit. You say, Lord, is there anyone I need to forgive? Who has hurt me? Who rejected me? Who belittled me? Who whatever? Because, see, 100 years from now, it won't make any difference. It might if you hang on to it, but if you let it go, then it loses its power. How many think, I need to forgive somebody? Just unashamedly hold your hand up high. Big things, little things. Wave at me. Here I am, Lord. How many need to forgive yourself for something? Wave excitedly. Yeah, I want to get free of that. Why don't we just take a moment and clear the deck, right? Say it after me, Lord. I choose to forgive myself and others for this, that, and the other. And you can fill in the blanks. They owe me nothing because the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is sufficient for me. Take a big, deep breath. Breathe the anointing in. Blow that garbage out. And just let peace begin to flow like a river. All right. How many need a miracle in the room? How many need a healing in your body? How many don't need one, but if there's extras around, you can maybe God have them take one of those. Yeah, my little finger problem, I can put up with that. But wait a minute, no. He wants to take that too. Big things, little things, and everything in between. All right, children. Here's what we're going to do. Just above your head is unlimited resources of heaven. And if you'll just reach up like a little kid and by faith put your hands into that electric, oily presence, the heat of God, the weight of God, power will begin to come upon you. Power to heal power to deliver, power to break curses, power to heal sick bodies, power to set captives free. So I want you to, by faith, just put your hands up into that glory realm right now. Because, see, the kingdom of heaven is right here. It's within your reach. It's at hand. And you just eat a little step of faith that reaches up and grabs a handful of it. And of course, you can wait upon them. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. So just give it a moment. Oh, Holy Spirit, I so love you. I so love your presence. I realize that we are connected to this invisible power source called God, the Holy Spirit. It's called the kingdom of God, the rule and reign of God. The very thing Jesus operated in. I take a hold of it right now. And we're going to do this twice. And the first time, I want you to Bring your own anointed hands down. Say, Lord, I give my hands to you. I loan them to you. Let my hands be like an extension of the hands of Jesus. And bring them down and place them on your body where you need a miracle. 
heads and shoulders, knees and toes, hearts, kidneys, stomach, spine, neck, eyes, ears, knees, whatever. And let that power start to flow into your need. And say this after me. This healing belongs to me. Because of what Jesus has done. I receive my healing, my miracle now. In the name of Jesus. As a free gift of his love. So now, pain, go. Every joint that's out of place or whatever, come into line. Talk to it and give it the order. Eyes, see clearly. Ears, hear clearly. This, that, and the other, whatever is not working right. Begin to work. Blood sugar, come into line. All the body measurements, come into line. Blood pressure, normalize. In Jesus' mighty name, kingdom of heaven, come. Will of God, be done in my life, here on earth, here in Raleigh, just as it is in heaven. Now let that flow in a moment. Now I want you to check yourself. And if you had symptoms, if you had pain or lack of mobility or some way that you could tell, you can, sometimes you can't always tell. You don't know if your blood pressure is normal or whatever. But if you can tell something's changed right now while we prayed, I want you to wave your hand at me. Just wave excitedly, like really excitedly. Like, wow, there's hands waving all over the place. So, so listen, if, if you're waving your hand, I want you to run down to the front here real quick. Come on. Don't think about it. Don't say, oh, well, I don't want to. No, no, get down here quickly because I want you to get all of it. Some of you got 50%. Some of you got 80%. Some of you got 10%. Calm down. What happens, Witty, right here? Um, my knee has been coming out of the joint and it's been very painful for the last three weeks. And what happened now? Oh, it doesn't hurt when I walk anymore. I just, little, I just need a little bit. Take the little bit, I pray, in Jesus' name. Carol, come on up, honey, and we'll get a mic and we'll, we'll take some testimonies. What happened to you, young man? My lower back has been in a lot of pain, and the pain is just starting to slowly go away. In Jesus' name. So it's gone. So when did it leave? Can you tell me? As I started praying. Yeah. Right when you were praying. Right as I was praying. Yeah. Were you surprised? No. No. See, I always am. I'm like, wow, it worked, you know, but he's not. Fire on him right here in Jesus' precious name. Can we get a microphone for Carol? Just right down here. What happened with you? Um, I believe my spine is straightening. Um, I've been praying about it for a long time, and I've, I've had a lot of dreams of Jesus healing it and me growing. And my friends have been telling me this past week, they're like, You're, you look taller. So I'm just receiving it and claiming it. Ask what happened there, Carol. I had shoulder surgery and it didn't work and I haven't been able to raise my arm, but look, I can get it that high. It's not all there yet, but I, I can do that. Yeah, so so you, you, you had surgery yeah, it and didn't it didn't work. really work, you it said. Didn't work. Yeah, Say, Lord, up. I forgive those people. Oh, yeah, forgive them they all, did yeah. the best they knew how and uh, didn't work. I forgive yeah. them. Yeah. Have mercy on me right have, now have and heal me. my shoulder. In the name of Jesus. Check it again for me. Are we getting anywhere? Yeah, she's getting it up. Okay. Wow, all of it, Lord. What happened to you, sweetie? Whoa. Jesus' name. I was diagnosed with high blood pressure, and I did not want to take the medication. 
and I just felt my high, my blood pressure was really high today, and I had tightness in my chest, and just as we prayed, I just felt peace come over me. Peace like a river. Flow in her, holy one. What happened to you? My, my, my eye floater is gone. It's gone. I'm looking at everybody like I can see you. How long had you had those? It's been, I've had it for six months, and it went away, but then it came back with a vengeance, and it's gone. Just lay hands on your eyes one more time and say, never again. Never again. In Jesus' name. name. We could take another hour and hear testimonies. What happened to you, young man? So I've been, you know, batting a lot of spiritual attacks. A lot of it is like, you know, thoughts working against me. A lot of intrusive thoughts. Just, you know, very much battling it. And, you know, throughout t- tonight, I feel like it's been clearing up, and I feel like a, s- a sense of peace has been coming through my thoughts. So I just cl- claim it. You know, I, I claim it now, today. And I claim it forever. Just drink that. Everything of shame and guilt and all the words of the accuser, I just break them off of you right now. Rise up, son of God. Put a smile on your face and enjoy your Savior's love and freedom. Oh, yeah. Now, we want to do one more thing because we're... Have you got one more there, Mark? You got the little finger? Come on. That's, which one, Sharon? That one? What happened to it? I don't know. It just started hurting really bad. And the doctor said, oh, you probably got arthritis. I said, no. No arthritis. So that was my little figure. Yeah. <laughs> what happened to this gentleman? What happened to you, sir? I've been having trouble with my sacroiliac. It's been aliacing. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I've been walking bent over. Yes. I'm straight. Yes. You're straight. You are straight. I am straight. Fire on him right there in the name of Jesus. All right. So what we want is to see this transition into a citywide Revival that spreads to the nation and the world. And the way that will work is you do the very same thing you just did with yourself, but you do that on another person. Sounds simple? Now see, the, the, the five things that Jesus gave them to do, do you remember them? Number one, preach the kingdom. Announce, hey, the kingdom of heaven's right here. Number two, Heal the sick. Number three, cleanse the lepers. Number four, raise the dead. Number five, cast out demons. If you do all that, your problem will be, where do we put all the people? Okay? So, I want you to get back with one of your friends, family, wife, spouse, husband, uh, friend, or somebody you never met before, just get in twos, ideally, or threes, because we're going to practice on each other. You know, Carol and I, when we started our church in Stratford, Ontario, that's now Trevor's church, we practiced on those poor people for all those years. That's how we learned how to do this stuff. Right? Yeah, listen to this. So, John, I've I've done this many times with you putting my hands up, and I was kind of like, you know, you know, I've done this again. Anyway, my calf was bothering me all day. I touched it, and it's completely healed. There's like zero pain in it at all. I'm actually quite shocked, to be honest. And 
Uh-huh. And, it, and it's, it's amazing. All right, get with a friend. Now, here's what we're going to do. Are you listening? Don't pray yet. What we're going to do is get the anointing all over our hands, and you're going to put them up, and you're going to invite the Holy Spirit to come upon you and use little old you. See, when Jesus prayed for people, something happened. There was power that flowed through him into that person. Remember the woman that tried to sneak up and said, I won't, I won't say anything, I'll just touch his clothes and he won't know. Well, he felt power flow out of him. And so he turned around and said, who just touched me? You know. Well, power will flow. So I want you to reach up your hands and just... By faith, come on, children, put your hands up into the glory of God, into that electric presence of the Holy Spirit. Get that oil and fire all over them. Now bring your own hands down, armed and dangerous, and say to your friend, what do you need tonight? What do you need? And you're going to take turns praying for each other. And so when they tell you, I don't want you to pray like 10 minutes worth of verbiage. Here's what you're going to say. Kingdom of God, come. And will of God be done. Pain, go. Sickness, go. Healing, come. In Jesus' name. Ready? Go for it. Come on, put your will behind it. Let the anointing flow through you. Pick up your anointing and use it. You mighty little anointed one, you. What's that? Ears open. Yeah. Open. Everything that Father wants out, it goes out now. Everything that Father wants in, come in now, Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, as a free gift of his love. Pray for one another. Don't take more than a minute. If you notice the prayers of Jesus all took about 30 seconds or less. Go to the pool and wash. Pick up your bed and walk. That doesn't take long. Speak to that problem. Speak to that sickness. Speak to that pain and say, come out of my friend in Jesus' name. Release them. And if you're watching at home, I want you to try this at home right now. You speak to your own body. You speak to your family or friends that are around you. And just say, kingdom of God, come. Will of God be done. Right here on earth as it is in heaven. In the mighty name of Jesus. All right. Now, very important. I want you to check yourselves and examine what used to hurt, examine what wouldn't work right, wouldn't move right. And if you think that we're getting somewhere with this, you're feeling better, God's doing it, I want you excitedly to wave your hands all over the room and say something amazing has just happened to me when my friend prayed. Come on, wave excitedly if that's you. Yeah. The hands all over the room. People are waving. See, God wants to use you. The whole thing is multiply the workers. Multiply them and let the kingdom come and God's will be done.
Oh, my goodness. All right. Have we got two or three more really good testimonies? What happened to you? Pray for your mom. Is she on the phone right now? Huh? Fire on that Parkinson's disease, Lord God. Let that mom come completely normal. Hey, Carol. Carol. Can you come and check on this guy right here? The Lord's healing his hearing. How many have a testimony of something that just happened right here? What happened? I wish we could get it. Anyway, what happened? I've been suffering a glaucoma for years, and my right eye will give me trouble, and I can see clear like the right eye now. My right eye? Yeah. I can see clearly now. And it wasn't clear before? I can see you real good now. Foggy. Uh huh. And it just cleared right up. Jesus, thank you for that miracle. Fire on her right here. And fire on that eye. Ooh. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow, who else has got a testimony? Come on, don't be shy. What's, what's going on with him, Carol? <laughs> She's in the thick of it. What happened to you, honey? So the Lord has been straightening out my legs, and when I was praying, I felt my left knee cracking, and I felt the Lord, like, repositioning it. So your left knee is feeling better, is that it? Yeah, it's straightening. I felt it straighten. It's straightening. So if you look at it or feel it, I said, look different. Well, I felt it straighten. So I believe it's She felt it straighten. Thank you for the fire of God on her right here. Oh, breathe him in, honey. Breathe him in. Breathe him in. Oh, just take it. Just breathe him in. You can pray later. Breathe it. Take it. Yes. Any others? Is your hand up? What happened to you? Come on. I was born with cerebral palsy, so I get a lot of stiffness in, in my knees and my joints. Yeah. And when you pray, uh, my legs started like floating almost like it's easier to lift. Like my normally my knees, like they feel my legs feel real heavy. Uh -huh. And I know God is doing something and I just receive. Just enjoy that then. Thank you, Father. You're just touching this man's legs and knees. In Jesus' name, cerebral palsy, go. Healing come. Ah, Shaba. John? Yeah. I finally got, I, I finally got him. He has, he has two hearing aids in, and he lost one. And anyway, God healed him tonight. He's got both of them out. And he could hear me talking to him. But he's so out of it. The guy had <laughs> two hearing aids in. He lost one somewhere. Yeah. And the other one's out. He can hear Carol perfectly. <laughs> but he's so out under the power that there's just no way we're going to get him up, I don't think. Why don't we try, Carol? Guys, try and stand him up so that the video can get a look at him at least. There he is. What do you think, young man? Still can't hear you guys. <laughs> Isn't God good? Yeah. 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 Can you hear me? Is that unusual? Yeah. You wouldn't be able to hear me otherwise? I can read your lips. So. What did he say? I can read your lips. Oh, he could. Oh. 
Say Jesus. <laughs> what did I say? I hear this one opening. Your ear just opened. This one. Lord, thank you, Father, for him. Fire on him here. In Jesus' mighty name. All right, Steve Long, where are you? Uh, come on back. I'll pass the microphone over. And, uh, but hey, why don't you turn to somebody and say, we're just getting going here. This is, we got another whole day tomorrow, all day Friday and Saturday. I mean, come on. Let's give Jesus a big shout, shall we? Come on. Come on from the bottom of your heart. Jesus. We worship you. We give you praise and thanks. 